Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and this is Your Strata Property. This week I am bringing you an interview that is a little different to our usual and that's because it is not an interview conducted by me. I'm bringing you an interview by Veronica Morgan and Chris Bates for their property podcast, which is called The Elephant in the Room. Now, there's a very important reason why I have decided to bring you an interview from another podcast. Veronica and Chris in this episode are talking to two experts, John Roydhouse, the CEO of the New South Wales branch of the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australasia, and Jonathan Russell, National Manager of Public Affairs at Engineers Australia. Now, they are asking and answering a number of important questions, including these. Is the build quality and safety of newly constructed residential properties up to scratch? Why is the financial well-being of the owners of new apartments in particular at risk? What's the downside of an infrastructure and building boom coupled with hurried design, approval, construction and compliance processes? They cover off the fact that 7 out of 10 new residential buildings have defects and they talk about how the Opal Tower and La Crosse Tower disasters or the London Grenfell Tower tragedy might have been prevented. Now, this information is absolutely vital for us as apartment owners and those servicing the strata sector. And when I listened to this interview myself last week, I decided there was no better way to bring this information to you all quickly and effectively than to deliver you Veronica and Chris's interview with Jonathan and John as is. And I'm very grateful to say I have the agreement of everyone involved in that broadcast to be able to bring it to you here on the Your Strata Property podcast. Now, Veronica Morgan is a real estate agent, a buyer's agent, and the co-host of Fox Hill's Location, Location, Location Australia. She is also a previous guest here on our podcast. And for more from Veronica, check out our episodes 55 and 115. And Chris Bates is a financial planner, mortgage broker, and wealth coach. Veronica and Chris join forces and produce the Elephant in the Room property podcast, which they say finds out what's really going on in the world of real estate. Each week they get into the psyche of buyers, agents, auctioneers and other industry experts to learn the truth about how buyers are influenced and why they do the things that they do with the aim of helping us all make better property decisions. Now, both Rena Van Oust and I have been previous guests on the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, and you can check out episodes 132 and 135, where you'll be able to listen to those interviews and inside look into each of our experiences as a strata lawyer and a strata manager. But in this episode that I am about to bring to you, Veronica and Chris are addressing some pretty big elephants in the room. One of those is that in New South Wales, anyone can call themselves an engineer. No qualifications required. Some pretty scary stuff. Now, this episode is a little longer than our usual. Veronica and Chris's podcast generally run closer to the one hour mark, but every minute of this episode holds immense value. You might even want to listen to it a couple of times. If you want to hear more from Veronica and Chris and their property podcast, you can check it out over at theelephantintheroom.com.au. And I am indeed very grateful to them for allowing us to bring this vital information to you here on Your Strata Property. So let's head over now to Veronica Morgan and Chris Bates interviewing John Roydhouse and Jonathan Russell. Enjoy. In this episode, we're going to address one of the biggest elephants in the room so far in this podcast, and it relates to the safety, build quality, the financial well-being of apartment owners, and the potential for devastating tragedy if nothing is done about it. 
but that's got your, your ears pricked up. This is something that I didn't know until recently, that in Australia, engineers don't have to be registered. In fact, pretty much anyone can call themselves an engineer. Now, how this plays out is that when we have an infrastructure and a building boom coupled with hurried design, approval, construction and compliance processes, people working in the sector may not actually be qualified to do the work. Now, we only have to mention Opal Tower let alone Grenfell Tower or Lacrosse Tower, to start imagining the consequences. Now, today joining us are two people. So we've got um, a bit more, a few more voices in today's podcast. First of all, we have a farmer who's in Sydney talking about engineering. (laughs) Welcome, John Roydhouse. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Veronica and Chris. Um, Yes, I'm John Roydhouse and I am the CEO of the Institute of Public Works Engineering, Australasia, New South Wales Division. And that is a mouthful. Um, IPWEA for short is how we like to refer ourselves. We're a professional membership organisation looking after the interests of public works engineering, so all the public infrastructure around New South Wales. That's primarily local government but also gets into the private consultancy and state government, doing everything outside the actual building um, of of the residential towers that you've already referred to in the Opal Tower. So the water going in, the footpaths, the roads, all the transport and the waste coming out. Which is something we all forget really needs to be attached to the buildings we live in in order to make it comfortable (laughs) to live in. And our other guest uh, is Jonathan Russell, who works with Engineers Australia, the peak body for engineering profession, right? That's right. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Veronica. Thanks, Chris. Uh, So my name is Jonathan Russell. I work for Engineers Australia. It's a professional association. It... uh it is related to the Institute of Public Works Engineer Australasia in the sense that we cover engineers as well, but we cover the full breadth of engineers and engineering practice in, in Australia. So that includes um, public works uh, activities as well as civil construction, but also electrical, uh, defence engineering, mm-hmm. uh, biomedical engineering, the full, the full gamut. Now, all of this does impact every one of us every single day. Now, obviously, for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to focus on the residential construction side of things. But, you know, the implications of of the sorts of things that you're going to reveal to us today are widespread. So we don't want to limit it totally to residential and and, and narrow down the conversation if we should be talking about bigger picture stuff. So Mm -hmm. let's get stuck into this chat. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, John and Jonathan. Um, I mean, it's it's brilliant to have you both here, actually, because... You know, with construction, we always like to blame someone or we always like to, you know, blame the builder or blame the council, et cetera. And, you know, you two are complementing, I guess, the two important parts is the actual building and also the infrastructure around that building, which makes it, you know, it all, all worthwhile. I guess I'm a bit flabbergasted, I mean, around the engineers and, you know, what it takes to actually call yourself an engineer and, you know, I guess the dangers in, in not having, you know, rules around that. Can you explain what do you need to have to call yourself an engineer? In New South Wales, and I believe that's where most of your listeners are, yeah. it's uh, frightening small. You don't have to prove anything. Uh, anyone can call themselves an engineer in New South Wales. And that includes with uh, the apartment towers or the civil construction. In You introduced at the beginning, Veronica, that engineers don't need to be registered anywhere in Australia. Now, there are shades of grey around the country. Queensland has a great system that we think. Since 1930, to be provide engineering services, you do have to be registered. Mm. You do have to actually pass a degree, have experience, and then demonstrate that you're a fit and proper person. In Victoria, where I understand a lot of your listeners are as well, in the residential um, construction arena, there are some categories of engineer which need to be registered, but then you move north across the Murray River to to New South Wales, and, you know, legally anyone can uh, can get involved. Um, So what we're, we're calling for is that, that that just doesn't make sense. I mean, we're talk, going to talk about a Dumbo later. I think that's a fairly big Dumbo. That is yeah. a Dumbo, yep. <laughs> and I guess, um, you know, where does an engineer kind of – because I do a lot of work with all of my clients are actually working in construction and I mm. kind of understand the process and et cetera, but where does engineers mainly come into the construction process mm-hmm. and where do the problems start? So there are engineers involved in – so engineers are involved in pretty much everything, all parts of life. In this studio, sound studio, for example, there'll be engineers involved in making the microphones work. In a building, it's much more obvious because engineers design and then build, construct the, 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 the building. But a building is also like a system. So you don't just have a structural engineer doing the drawings for how to um, make it go up vertically. You've also got fire safety engineers to make sure that 
um, the cladding is safe, and that's another big topic that's been going around for a mm. few years now, mm. that the fire escapes are all work from an engineering and a human sci- um, sort of social science point of view as well. You've got the, the waste that John mentioned before that needs to come out of the building, mechanical services engineers, the air conditioning, the refrigeration engineers. So there's an engineer is going to be involved in designing pretty much all of the building, mm-hmm. and then once the design is made, there are engineers involved in actually following the designs and then constructing it, putting it up. And uh, so the, they're the two main ways that I think it's easy to conceive what engineers do in, in this in the residential arena. And on it, the end of that, is there engineers who are signing off on it or is that a separate role? Okay. So from a so in Queensland, if you're going to be providing engineering services and you're going to be signing off on the work, then you're going to need to be registered. In New South Wales, there are still going to be people signing off on the work. It's like any other... A uh, company would have a risk management process in place. So the the big design consultancy will have senior engineers supervising jun- more junior engineers and signing off on their work. And then there'll be people at a construction site who are supervising the work. The gap in the system in New South Wales is that there's no system for quality quality control. And where issues are identified, there's no mechanism to um, uh, deal with a, an individual who's not up to task and providing sanctions to either re-educate or remove them from the system entirely. It, it, unlike a medical, like a medical doctor, someone makes a complaint and then they, you realise that they're not competent, so mm. they shouldn't be practising as a doctor. Mm. They're removed from the system. They can't do it anymore. With engineering, it would be possible for someone who, who was dodgy enough to keep on moving through the system. I, I guess the, the, the key point is you can look at an engineering function and there's the pure engineer and then there's the technician. And we do need to separate those. And a lot of Mm. the functions are being done by a technician, not by an engineer. What an engineer has to do is they have to do the design. They have to do it to certain standards. In fact, the engineers write the standards and that's one of the key things. And in doing that, they're assessing risk all the time. And that's part of their professional standing is to assess the risk. What What is the satisfactory level of risk in doing that? And if I design it in such and such a way, what's actually going to happen? And that is the big distinction that we're seeing is there, there's a lot of people who've got the technical expertise, but they're not qualified to do the actual function. So when you say the technician, what do you mean by that? Though? A technician can be everyone from a construction worker through to a paraprofessional, someone learning the trade. They're certainly not qualified to sign off, but they're actually out there doing the job. And that's the problem we see in New South Wales a lot, whether it's in private construction or in public infrastructure. So the design's good, but then potentially the build and the sign-off isn't happening by the engineers, it's happening by technicians, and they're not really kind of double-checking what the engineer to achieve in the first place. The, the, you do have that risk. It was really interesting. I ran a development engineering forum last October in Sydney, and that was local government engineers who are involved with the development application process and doing the assessments, everything for local councils. It was private certifiers who in New South Wales do have to be qualified to sign off on, on, private, certif- on private construction, and property developers and some large property developers all wanted to do the right thing, but all were looking back towards the engineers to actually write those standards. And then the private certifiers are saying, we can then do our job if we know what those consistent, concise standards are. Property developers want to do the right thing, but again, they are looking for standards to be set. So now I know it's going to be really difficult for you guys to comment on Opal Tower because there's a massive investigation going on and, of course, it might take years to work out really what you know, the root of the cause was, and I'm sure it was never not one thing as well. I'm sure there's a complicated web of things. But in a general sense, how can that sort of thing go wrong? How can that happen? The final report into the Opal Tower incident came out in uh, February, so just a few weeks ago, and um, they found what it seemed to the, to the investigators happened is that there was the building was designed, but then the as-built building wasn't to the high enough spec. And so there's still, as you say, they're still trying to unpick what really went wrong. Mm. But it appears that the design may may have been right, but then 
the way it was constructed wasn't to their exact design. Right. It's what John was saying. You had mm. people who didn't perhaps even understand the design yeah. fully mm. um, to be able to actually apply it. Now, one of the recommend there were sort of three main recommendations that came out of the Opal Tower report, and uh, they're not new recommendations. And I'll go into that. <laughs> I'm sure they're yeah. not. And the report authors said that if these three recommendations had already been in place, then the chances of Opal Tower happening would have been much, much reduced, if not eliminated. And so the first one was to register engineers uh, so that you can identify someone who is competent and there's a higher, there's, it acts as a risk management framework. It encourages people to maintain their continuing professional development mm-hmm. uh, and they're obviously going to have to be experienced so that unless, until you're at a certain level of experience, you can't be registered. The second thing was to have all the designs checked by a third party, independent third party. Mm. Now, big design houses uh, probably do this sort of in-house, like they get a different team to to do a third-party review, but the report suggesting that independent third-party reviews would provide an extra level of rigour. So you get a completely disinterested party, if you like, to Mm. check it off. And the third thing was to have uh, more, more and more formal stages of inspection so that when it comes time to pour the slab, you have someone who understands the design come over and watch and check that, all right, this is how we actually wanted, this is how we intended it to be poured. And then when they're sort of putting the building up at certain stages, checking that, okay, this is actually being constructed in the way that was intended, therefore is going to be, is going to be safe. Mm. The, the, the two key things coming out of that final report was, number one, the registration of engineers. There's- been very clear and has come through several reports over many years that we need to introduce that in, in the state of New mm. South Wales. Queensland's had it since 2002 uh, by legislation and Victoria did introduce the legislation uh, in 2018. It went through the lower house, got through two reading speeches of the upper house and their state election got in the road, so it didn't get to the final reading speech. I do understand that the Victorian Treasurer who introduced the original legislation has made the commitment to reintroduce it into this term of Parliament. So hopefully we will see it in Victoria. New South Wales is dragging the chain. The second part is, as Jonathan was just saying, is the technicians that I referred to that are doing the work, the, the pouring the concrete and things, having someone on site who actually understand and be able to read the plans and understand and again, train them up to actually be the next generation of engineers. So actually instilling professional development and training into those people as well is really important. And I mean, I guess the, you know, the one of the recommendations you said there is get an independent party to look over the plans. I mean, there's a cost to that. So, of course. you know, and, you know, there's another additional cost to the cost of the apartment. And, you know, a builder's not going to want to pay that. And mm. that's going to mean they're going to have to sell it for more money. And, so I guess, you know, there's a lot of people who won't want that, you know, and mm. I guess the independent review of, you know, these professionals, if, if you're in a construction boom, you know, construction salaries have already gone up a ridiculous amount in this boom. <laughs> um, and that's everyone, everyone who's in the construction industry. Um, I mean, how do you, with, with building this amount of apartments, is there actually enough talent that is actually certified to actually, you know, Go around, basically. When it comes to engineers, I'd say, yes, there is. There is enough talent. Um, There are about 330,000 engineers in the (laughs) labour force at the moment. Now, not all of those are in the the residential construction area, but construction across the broader range of uh, sort of disciplines is the third largest employer for engineers. So there are an awful lot of of Mm. them out there. Um, And then to whether there's a cost-benefit analysis that that needs to be done. Mm. So... Opal Tower, it would have cost more to go slower and have more checks and make sure that the, the person building it could actually do it to the design. Yeah. But the benefit of, you know, to why well, that cost is that you didn't have an evacuation. You don't have a building that's going to have a question mark over it for, for the rest of its term. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because, you know, one of the constant themes through this, this podcast is this idea of people are chasing short-term gains, they're not thinking about the long-term. Mm. And this is an absolute classic example of that, where you don't want to pay too much for your apartment, but, oh, hell, mm. I, you know, those, I mean, there's been certain figures banded around around the values of those now. And to say that they've dropped in value by 75 to 80%. I mean, even then you say, well, who would buy one even at, mm. even at 80% well, what, discount? Well, no bank would lend on it. Well, there's, you know, there's a whole... So you can't borrow unless you've got all cash. Um, I may be showing my age, but when I went to school, I was taught you do things right the first time. Mm. 
Mm. (laughs) And I think that's really important. And there are stats floating around that when the new new buildings, that seven out of ten have defects Mm. at at the time of purchase. That's not acceptable and that's adding to the cost long term. For anyone that wants to buy into residential real estate, if they're not buying something that's up to the specification or standard when they're purchasing it and then it has to come and rectify, it's a lot more expensive to rectify after something's being built than getting it right the first time. And I, I hate to be political, but we're seeing that with the Sydney stadiums at the moment mm. and the debate around those, which will be decided at the election, mm. the election coming up, obviously, but well, I mean, we didn't get the, it right the first time. That's the problem, really. I mean, we're building housing stock to sell um, and the biggest way to sell it is to make it cheap and because, you know, when you're you know, some, an investor, mainly mm. investor buys these apartments, not really home buyers, and investors go around, they shop the market, and they'll go to three or four, and, and one bed's 445 at this pace, and it's 480 at the other mm. one, or 520 at the other one. Maybe the 521 is the best building, but the investor says, oh, it should be good enough. I'll just go for the $445,000 one. Mm. Um, it's nearby. I'll get the same rent. Um, and so what we do is, you know, we self-fulfill, you know, and basically buy the cheap building. And I mean, and that's kind of the problem here is the developer isn't incentivized to d- make a better product because yeah. the consumer won't pay it. Well, I think, uh, so I mentioned that those recommendations weren't new mm. um, from the Opal Tower. So a year and a bit ago, the Council of Australian Government's Building Ministers Forum commission, uh, had a report delivered to it that it commissioned. For your listeners, the Council of Australian Governments is a forum of the Prime Minister and the Premier of every state and uh, territory who get together and talk about big cross-jurisdictional policy issues. Building Ministers Forum is a subset of that where it's the minister of each of those jurisdictions who's responsible for buildings. And so the BMF commissioner at an investigation into the building and construction sector to the regulation of it and the enforcement of those regulations. And so a year ago... One of the, well, recommendation one was register engineers. And amongst the other 24 recommendations was one to have these more stages of inspection or more standardised and more tightly enforced stages of inspection. So they're exactly the same as the Apple Tower report yeah. recommendations. So you're right, there, there may be less incentive for developers to bother with the, the, the stages of inspection. Uh, and I'm not saying that... Uh, when we talk to, say, the property council, they're totally on board with us about mm. what needs to change. So I, it's, I wouldn't want your listeners to think that I'm saying all the developers are, are avoiding no. their responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. um, but uh, if the government introduced this as a, as a rule, then it kind of takes the choice away from any levels developer of, that doesn't want to. Levels of yeah. playing field. Mm. I mean, and, and I think that's the issue, isn't it? It does have to come top down in this case because yeah. consumers clearly aren't going to demand it. They're uninformed consumers. <laughs> they yeah. are uninformed. Like and how, that's, how could they possibly know? Yeah. You know, if the building's been put up properly. Oh, yeah. They can't. And you say, John, they're about, you know, some stats around about four out of, um, sorry, seven out of ten new buildings have defects. And certainly I've been talking to a lot of people over the years and we've interviewed people in the strata sector here as well and talking about very similar things and that, you know, people buy brand new not expecting it to have major problems and yet the proportion of major problems in new is much higher than it is in existing buildings. So they seem to think that age causes problems, not actual the building itself or the structure of the building. And and so that's a really important message that needs to get out there, but it's not sexy, hmm. you know, whereas glossy brochures are. It, it isn't sexy. Uh, property developers, I think, in the main do want to do the right thing, hmm. but they have to meet market expectations. So they're looking, how, how do we do that? Because we've got to make housing affordable. Uh, we want to attract investment. So how do we do that? And unfortunately... Um, we don't always see standards being maintained. Yeah, and I guess the, I mean, the developer game is a, it's high risk. If you're a developer, mm. you're not, uh, you know, this isn't just, you know, I would run a shop and I'll just have the customers every day. You've got to put a lot of money in. You've got a lot of time the market. And if, if it goes wrong, you lose a lot of money. And unfortunately, when they start to get problems with buildings is, you know, they've, it, sometimes the builder and the developer is separate as well. Mm. And, you know, you start getting to a point where, you know, there are problems and, you know, sometimes it's like we've just got to get this finished. And so Opal's one example that's mm. come out. But do you believe that there's a lot more <laughs> Opal towers out there that haven't come out? Because end of the day, if you live in that building and you see defects, the mm. last thing you want if you own that building is to get that to get on the strata report and mm. that to become public knowledge. 
And so do you think that a lot of the stuff is kind of hidden away in a lot of these buildings that people don't want to discuss? They may not all be as dramatic as a loud bang on Christmas Eve and being kicked out of the building, uh, but there are a lot of buildings that have serious issues. In the, in the ACT, the government there is in the middle of, or the, so the Legislative Assembly is in, a, in the middle of doing a, an inquiry into the construction sector in the ACT. Uh, engineers have tried to put in one submission. There'll be plenty of others. And what some of our members are saying is that construction, that residential construction in the ACT for the past 10 years has led to an awful lot of substandard buildings. Nothing's going bang in the middle of the night, but there are plenty that have got you know, they're getting they're leaky or they're getting mm. mold issues or they're just little niggly things go wrong, which actually make them, if not uninhabitable, then far of far less value than you thought they were when you mm. forked out half a million dollars. Um, the same members say that there are good developers and, and, and builders in, in the ACT as well. But it goes to we, this idea of having registration is about also about trust. Yeah. If you are uh, and confidence. So if you're entering a, a market which you think is overheated, everyone's working working too fast, the checks aren't being done, that's going to lower the, the potential value to, of the apartments because the general consumer base is going to be less confident mm. that this is actually a good investment for me. Mm. Maybe I will look at snapping up a, a building from 1930 that all the, all the issues have been shaken out of that one mm. and just do a little reno job. Maybe that's a better option. So th- these are the things that, um, that, I, that I think any builder, engineer, developer or anyone else who's thinking about maybe cutting a corner or going too fast, needs to think about it. It's about trust and confidence in the market. I think one of the issues with, you know, because it's quite complex. I mean, the fact is that we see a lot of developers building stock that we call investor stock, right? And so what that means is that they've just carved up their airspace into the maximum amount of apartments that they can have and the maximum amount of profit. And look, hats off. At the end of the day, they're in business to make money. I'm not mm. I'm not here saying that they shouldn't do that. However, they're, they're building stock that appeals to investors, not necessarily to e- even tenants, let mm. alone owner-occupiers. And so it's a very short-term view. And the person carrying the can for that really is the idiot investor, the, the unsophisticated investor who does buy that property. Um, now, that's in a sense, you know, they've made various decisions based on Whatever, whatever information they've they've um, they've based their decisions on, but the thing is that developer is built to a market now, mm. and a lot of people's come come to us and they say, "Oh, but they wouldn't build it if there wasn't a market for it." I'm like, "Yeah, but this is chicken and egg. You've created that market because you've marketed it to those would be investors to tell them it's a good investment. They've believed you and they've bought it. Then they've found out it wasn't such a great investment. Uh, it's too late." Mm. And a little bit the same with this case, you know, where you've got builders or developers that are, you know, they're not incentivized to um, make sure that the long-term uh, investment is a good one because they offload it and then there's a period of, you know, stat- the statutory period hmm. that they've got responsibility towards that building and then once that's gone, whatever, they're on to the next, the next project, you know. So the person that really ends up carrying the can for all of these decisions is the buyer. It's not just the buyer. It's actually local and state government get involved as well. Okay. Uh, and that's the surrounding infrastructure. And, and yes, developers pay a Section 94 contribution to to help fund the ongoing maintenance of the supporting infrastructure for, for these developments. But at the end of the day, the developer's gone, he's taken their investment, gone on to the next project. And 20 years later, the road has to be replaced. Mm. The road has to be resurfaced. There needs to be sporting grounds put in. There needs to be changes to, to those sporting facilities. A library needs to be built. Public transport has to be built. It's the local and state government that actually also has to support. We've seen a situation a decade ago, I suppose now, of the collapsing sea walls and frontage up on the... Narrabeen. Northern, Narrabeen, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Collaroy. Yeah, yeah, Collaroy. And councils had to go and fund that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So it's not just new buildings. It's, it's happening all the time. So it's coming back to the planning stages, and that's why local councils are so important in having that conversation about planning and future use in these prop- these developments. Which is a good point you just raised there because, of course, in New South Wales, I'm not sure about other states, you've got a situation where the state government's overriding local government. So, w- w- yeah, I mean, talk more about that. So at some point, communities need to have ownership and have conversations about the future shape of their, of their communities and what they want it to look like. And unfortunately, the state government has come in and, and played heavy hand, and, but I think the tide is turning back. Uh, because at the end of the day, it is local residents who have to pay for that community infrastructure. Mm. So they do need to have a say in what it looks like and what their future environment looks like. But yeah. I mean, what 
local people would say is it's NIMBY mentality. And, you know, what people understand is what makes their suburb likeable and livable and why people want to live there is because of the way it is currently today. And what people will want to do in the future <laughs> is not change a single thing. And what that does do is, so if you ask anyone in Vaucluse or Mossman or go around, you know, Sydney, they don't want any more infrastructure. They don't want any more, you know, development. You know, the problem but with that's other- That's a little different that they're there because, you know, they're well, they're close to the CBD already and well-serviced and there's they're pretty much- you know, constrained in terms of available land and all the rest of it. But you, you're probably talking areas where there's more scope for a lot more residents, like, you know, where you've got a redevelopment of industrial sites for arguments, like a rezoning's happening, I would think. Or, or knocking down old buildings, I mm. think. Like yeah. you mentioned nice suburb. I live in a nice suburb and um, <laughs> yeah. I, I like it the way That's it is. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But I look at uh, older houses and, oh, it's not going to be long before that one's gone. And sure enough. Off it goes, and then you notice that yeah. the next one, the one next door, has obviously been bought because the grass is growing long, and it's next. Mm. Um, and up goes the development. Uh, but that's a rezoning too, though, isn't mm. it? And and how much of that is local versus state? I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Because I think I, I mean on that sort of micro yeah, level, yeah. I think it'd be the the local government. Yeah, but well, then the, it is very much local government. And I'll, I'll just go back and I'll challenge you, Chris, because. Coming to this podcast this morning, I've come from Dubbo via Tamworth, which sounds a little bit crazy and that's mm. a whole long story. <laughs> but there's a whole different world out there. Mm. And I have four children and three of the four actually live and have invested in regional New South Wales because it is so much more affordable to live out there. I personally have bought real estate on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and that's my retirement dream and that's where I'll be going um, to get away from some of these problems. So there are other options out mm. there and it's, it's going out regional areas. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, obviously there's, you know, more land there, but there's not really an affordability problem there. I mean, where this is, you know, why people are buying apartments or living apartments is they can't afford the house. Mm -hmm. And so what we do, need to do is create more livable housing. But, you know, you ask the communities in those areas, they don't want to change anything. So it's kind of like what ends up happening is all the apartments basically go to councils where they're willing to build them. And um, then you get start getting the infrastructure problems, which, you know, you'll mm. see. So we basically just start pushing you know, all these new buildings into, generally speaking, it's, it's the outer suburbs and outer councils because they get through council a lot easier and the councils want the rates a lot more. Um, and, you know, and so... <laughs> Is he a slightly conspiracy theorist? <laughs> oh, oh, look, I'm, I'm sure. I, I was out in a Western <laughs> Metropolitan Council a couple of weeks ago and, and had a long conversation with, with the engineers out there. And they're part of the Northwest Coast Corridor and they're basically building 70,000 new residences. Yep. Huge, 200,000 new people they're, they're coming for in one local government area. <coughs> and they've got the challenges of providing the supporting infrastructure to that. So the supporting fields, just the road network mm. is to support that. And they've already got a couple of hundred thousand residents who've got some older ageing infrastructure. And they're saying, why is all the money being spent on developing this new infrastructure mm. versus maintaining the existing infrastructure? Real challenge for our engineers. And I mean, on that point there um, is, you know, what are the, if you go and build, you know, six towers, what's, how does, how do, what do you do to the sewerage system? You know, how do you, you, you have a very big one, but <laughs> I mean the cost to do so. And then what does that mean for all the other residents? And then, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, we, we just build the towers and think, well, you know, yeah. what do we, now, what about the electricity? What about the roads and, you know, that we're talking so it's it's good that we've moved on from just talking about one building yeah, to yeah. the system like the social system around it and at engineers australia we're constantly uh encouraging government to involve the en engineers in the decision making process now there need to be economists lawyers social scientists and all the rest of it as well but what we find is that often the engineering questions like what do we do about the sewer is coming way long time after the decision has been made to put up the six blocks in the first yeah. place. Yeah. And this is not this is for big decisions like do we put an airport, where do we put the airport or do we put a new railway line in? Um down to will we need to get uh dense we need to densify a corridor around a new light rail. We need to plan for this 20 years in the in advance. And what are the engineering solutions that could be done and some of the engineering issues that could be um th that might come up that we need to resolve. And what we've what we think is that there's not enough level of engagement with people who understand the technical ramifications and the technical possibilities. Yeah. Because if the 
to sort of explain what I mean by there, by that, if we're trying to get more people from A to B, oftentimes like, oh, we just need a, a new freeway. Mm. But before that, let's think about, all right, the objective is getting people from A to B. What is the most efficient way to do that? Do we just actually just rephase the lights? Or do we put in a heavy or light rail or car? Or maybe it is just a, a new road. Who knows? But you need to ask the question about how do we achieve the objective, not which road should we put in? It's a, oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, but when But that's not popular. I mean, that's not headline generating, is it? No, it's not. And yeah. so we've... Each, it, it isn't a headline, but what it actually is, it's actually building communities. It's beautiful. I love it. But, it, yeah, I mean, but it, but it's unfortunately our governments are so short-term. We talk, we talk about yeah. we worry about property buyers being short-term and they're thinking our governments are maximum four years. Mm. You know, they're really thinking about the next election. They're not thinking about anything else, are they? No, they're – well, oftentimes, oftentimes they're not. And um, really I, I think that if a government is announcing, like, the cutting of a ribbon of a, of a new railway line, that should be – it, ideally, that'd be a low key event because we all knew it was coming. But in an ideal world, yeah, we knew that was coming twenty years ago. Like, mm. well done, well done for delivering it. Mm. But um, mm. you're sticking to the plan as opposed to we're going to build a new railway line. Surprise! In two years' time, and you're like, okay, where did this idea come from? Why mm. do we suddenly need a new ra- railway line? Surely we thought about this for twenty years. And that is so true because I have to say, living in Sydney, and and all of a sudden there's a light rail going out to Parramatta, go, but there's a heavy rail already going out there. Why do they need a light rail as well? There's this Northern Beaches doesn't have a rail system at all. I mean, you know, like you just go, you're scratching your head thinking what? Mm. Um, and, you know, and then there's other things like, for instance, the Lane Cove Tunnel when that was built and then suddenly an apartment building's falling into it and you think, oh, someone missed something there, yeah. didn't they? I mean, um, and another one is, is like the, the Iron Cove Bridge in Dremoyne, right? Mm. So, you know, for years you've got this silly little bridge that was not coping, and so suddenly they decided to build a bridge to the side of it, and that was when I discovered this concept called design and construct. Mm. And it's like, oh, that's how everything's built. What it means it's built as it's it's designed as it's built. You know, it, I I mean I know that that's common, and and you can probably maybe assuage my fears on that. But I just was what? You know, yeah. wouldn't there be a lot more work done before you actually started it? Otherwise, finding out the problems as mm. you go. And I think that's probably a good example of how most people think of engineers and engineering is that you call them in when you've got a specific engineering issue, like mm. how do I build this bridge? But really the engineer needs to be brought in at very early stages to think about you know, what, are, what are the transport or, or construction issues that we're trying to overcome and then how do we actually ad- address them? So in New South Wales we've got an election this weekend, and I don't. This uh, podcast, we, inter- we we record them, and they don't come out straight away. So, so sorry, listeners, we'll know who our next premier and government is by the time this is released. But so there's a new election, and so it's state government, and I've seen all these billboards around from the Greens, right. <laughs> talking about congestion and those sorts of things. You know, we've got to have better public transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's sort of a bit ironic that it sounds like the Greens and Engineers Australia should be getting together. <laughs> On this. Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, she's moved to the federal Senate now, but Maureen Faruqi, uh, until she made that move, was a, an engineer in, in the Greens in New South Wales. Uh, so there is there is at least some connection there. Yeah, there so she, she actually was a local government engineer um, on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, actually a member of, of my organisation mm. as well, uh, and very active in road safety and traffic management is her specialty. So it's actually great to see them pick it up. Mm. The issue of public transport is a really interesting one because public transport doesn't deal with one of the major users of the road network, and that is heavy vehicles and transport. Mm. Get all our goods around. Mm. And that is a real challenge for engineers to deal with as we're getting higher productivity vehicles, uh, our, our B-doubles and our road trains and our, our other heavy vehicles. Yeah. Not just on the highways, we get them between capital cities but getting around what we call the first mile and last mile. So when they come off those highways and get to the distribution centres, get into the supermarkets, those sorts of places, that's a real issue, again, for, for engineers to be challenged by. I mean, you can see that in, in where we are, oh, in the city. I mean, Barangaroo, like there's literally big semi-trailers mm. going through the city at all hours of the day. And it's like how's, you know, it's an impact of that on the community with the light rail, like the disruption of that has on the community to build that is just enormous and it hasn't really been you know, thought through. I guess um, some of our listeners or some people have said to me is, look, you're anti-new, you hate new property, you shouldn't, which is true, but um, <laughs> that we shouldn't, what's your solution then? Like should, and I think, well, 
we still need to build it. I still, I mean, you know, I think we're still going to keep growing our population. You know, we're slowing it down apparently, but, um, you know, we're still going to keep growing our population. Our cities are going to keep growing. We still need to build new property. Otherwise, we're going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. My biggest problem is that we built the wrong stuff and we keep building the wrong stuff. And I guess is that kind of what you really want to change is that you, you know, all your engineers, if we're going to build this stuff, why don't we just build quality and why don't we actually build stuff that's going to last, that is built to standards, that is built with good materials and does suit our biggest problem, which is kind of families. Is is that kind of where you would like to see the industry move or is it different or...? Getting it right is really important. Setting standards is really important. I'll go back to my my last trip overseas and I spent a few weeks in the beautiful city of Paris. There was not a lot of new construction, but there's a lot of maintenance going on on buildings that are 12th century, 13th Mm. century, 14th century. They're still standing. Yeah. They were built right in the first place and that's what we want. And they're maintained. Yeah, and maintained, yeah. and and that's important. And again, to have suitably qualified people, the mm-hmm. registration scheme for engineers is crucial to ensure that those standards are written and set in the first place and then adhered to. It's absolutely crucial to having that. So yes, you can have new buildings, and we do need new buildings. We need new roads. We need mm. new water supply systems. And as we deal with, with autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, our road networks are going to totally change in how they operate mm. over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. We need to have engineers at the table setting those standards to make that infrastructure work. Yeah, it's a good point. Simon Kushimaka, um, in one of our episodes, I have no idea which episode, but he's a demographer. He's quite well known. He's part of Bernard Salt's kind of Demographics Institute and he's German and he's made the exact same point around – you know, the biggest problem we have is we have no middle ring. Um, you know, we've got big towers and we've got houses, but, you know, these big cities like your London's, your Paris, et cetera, they've got a really strong middle ring that's maybe six, seven levels high and it's been around for 600 years, you know, and it's built by quality and it retains value and you maintain it and you can keep growing your population. That's what we haven't got here. We just build, you know, things that are going to last at least seven years. Right. It's a worry, isn't it? And so, you know, in terms of buyers who are looking at buying something new, I mean, what can they do? Is there a sign that they can look for to give them some confidence or, you know, is there anything? Did you want to answer that, John, first? Uh, I, I would encourage listeners that uh, to do your due diligence when, when you're purchasing. Certainly talk to your real estate agent and anything that comes off the plan in particular make sure that the engineers who have signed off it have some appropriate qualifications. Engineers Australia runs a very, very good registration scheme and a certification scheme, and make sure that those engineers actually are chartered. If you're not in, not sure, ask the engineer to provide that certification certificate. And how can you find that? Like in yeah. a contract to sale or, you know, because most real estate agents wouldn't know just quietly. So Yeah, yeah. I think... What John said about being especially new build, that's probably the only way that it's um, possible with the old build stuff. I mean, who, who, the engineers yeah, involved are long gone, right? Yeah. yeah. It's still standing. <laughs> yeah, it's still standing. There's your proof. Um, you'd, you'd probably, I imagine the real estate agent probably have to talk to the developer. That now, the developer should know who's involved in their project. Um, and it could be one of two things, like ask the, ask the developer to assure you that they use people who are properly uh, qualified mm. and the other part is to maybe even get the names of the companies or p- people involved and, and check against a register. Mm. But then that becomes a problem. How do you check that they're actually suitable? Mm. Now, John mentioned that Engineers Australia has the National Engineering Register. It's a voluntary register for engineers. It has about 20, maybe 25,000 people on the register across the country. And I mentioned before that there are about 330,000 engineers um, in the labour force. So that's not not everyone's on it, obviously. So 25 out of 330,000. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in less lab- than 10%. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, I, maybe I should be a bit fair about the 330,000. Only just over half of those work as engineers, but that's mm. still 170. It's still only 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the what Engineers Australia is calling for in New South Wales is for both parties to commit to regis- bring in a registration system for engineers, a statutory one, so that it's no longer just a voluntary system. Because mm. for as long as it's voluntary, yeah. you can choose not to be on it. Yeah. Um, and then, so, and both parties in New South Wales, like you said, Veronica, will know the result <laughs> by the time your listeners get this. But 
The coalition has said that they'll introduce a registration scheme for engineers involved in residential construction. So that's yeah. directly relevant to, to what we're talking about here. We're not too sure exactly how comprehensive they're going to be about that uh, registration scheme, but they say that they're going to bring it in so that we don't have to address the Opal Tower report recommendations and the, uh, yeah. the COAG BMF recommendations I mentioned earlier. The Labor Party, and I think John probably knows a little bit more about their commitment, but um, they have also committed to have a registration scheme for engineers. Their focus has been on public infrastructure in, in their announcements. It's unfathomable to me that they would consider not including residential construction mm. related engineers. So I sort of, I assume they mean to include C- that as certainly well. Certainly my, my conversations on, on both sides of, of government and opposition, um, Jonathan, you've got it exactly right. Mm. Um, the, the current government is there for, for residential, um, but not necessarily for the, the other aspects of the, the building construction industry, including public infrastructure, mm-hmm. which is of concern. Mm. Yeah, I think. Um, New well, South yes. Wales has 180,000 kilometres of road network. Um, we well, we, we have at- a serious road fatality issue. That costs the state government $7.5 billion just in road trauma costs. Wow. Um, and that's an affecting 400-odd families a year with, with fatalities, mm. let alone the 12,000 injuries. And you're putting the responsibility of that onto the actual road design and maintenance and all that sort of thing, or, or part of that? Is that what you're saying? Roads need maintenance. Yeah. Mm. Uh, they need design and, and they have to be constructed. Um, they're, they're major issues, well, issues look at, for, look, for, for, our, for our community. Look at what um, happened in Italy. Oh, oh, bridge collapsed. Mm. Bridge collapsed. You know, that's we're, a maintenance we're, we're, issue. Touchwood, we yep. haven't had one of those in New South mm. Wales. And I guess that's the one blessing with the Opal Tower. We haven't seen any fatalities. Mm. Mm. No one's been hurt. Um, so that's something we can be thankful for. We've had the warning signs though, right? Mm-hmm. We've had the, um, you know, the big apartment block in Melbourne that went up, the cladding. The cross. Um, yep. You know, and they've, they've been there and they're, you know, those buildings still exist, you know, today mm. and they still got the same risk. They've still got the cladding there. I mean, how, how, how can you go back in time and change these buildings? And what's the solution? Do you have to knock them down or? No, well, no, 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 they, they can be fixed. But, again, you'd want a good engineer mm. to assist in that process. And, again, we want standards to be set and maintained, which mm. is why we've been campaigning mm. so hard for recognition and registration of engineers. So to actually set those standards. And in New South Wales, you don't need to be a registered fire engineer to design the safety systems on the high rise. Mm. Um, whereas uh, it beggars belief, doesn't it? It, it does beg a belief. <laughs> uh, if I could design a road, you don't have to yeah. be qualified. Yeah. It's crazy. It's up to whoever's employing or engaging you to do their due diligence and figure out that you've got the right skills suitable. But, um, but when it's a public it, issue or a social issue, yeah. is that... Should that be outsourced to someone who's trying to make money? Yeah, it's. I mean, you think about a doctor working <laughs> in a in a surgery. The, the head of the surgery, of course, is doing his due diligence on the staff he employs. But then you, as a customer, come in. You don't go and check his doctor's certificate. No, no. You, tr- you trust that the system's there. And then if you do make a complaint about That's your right. doctor, you know that it can be followed up. In engineering at the moment, it's it's not the case. Well, and that's. I think. That's really important for listeners to understand, and obviously, you know, pressure your local member because mm. the thing is that we do trust so much. Mm. Every morning we wake up and we trust that our floor's not going to collapse. We trust that our ceiling's not going to fall in. Mm. We trust that the water's going to come out of the tap. We trust that, you know, when I put the key in the front door, it's going to open, mm. that the car will start, uh, you know, that the neighbour next door hasn't had a major blow up with his wife or whatever and going to blow up the whole neighbourhood. I mean, like, you just don't know. We trust all that stuff's not mm. going to happen. Mm. Um, and I think with the engineering side of things and the impact on so much of our, our environment, mm. you know, the built environment basically, isn't mm. it? But with the impact of engineering on every single thing that we do in our lives, to not have that um better regulated yeah. is quite shocking. So I think I'd like to encourage all listeners, and I'm going to do the same thing, I'm mm. going to my local member after next week. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and certainly there was a survey done last year and it was one of the Ipsos polls and the results came back that 93% of, of the respondents did want their engineers to be registered um, in fact, most of them were surprised they weren't mm. already. I think that's a good. That's a big point, really. Mm. I was, and I'm sure most people mm. are. It doesn't surprise me at all. So who's holding this back, right? So if everyone 
common sense. Mm-hmm. You know, we should have everyone legislated. We should, you know, have everyone credited, etc. Um, but obviously, it hasn't happened. Mm. And you know, and it, it's not like we're, you know, just all of a sudden become this country that has thought about this. This is obviously something that's been kicked <laughs> down the road for many years. Mm. Who doesn't want this to happen? Is it the construction industry more broadly? Is it the state government? You know, because um, you know, it, it actually makes too much mm. sense to to not do it, but. Someone's obviously trying to hold it back. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a, a point of order on something John said right at the beginning. Queensland's actually had it in some form since 1930. 2002 is the most recent edition of the, of yeah. the Act. So Queensland's way ahead of the game finally. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. We have Queensland <laughs> listeners too and we love you. Yeah. <laughs> it's sunny up there. Yeah. Anyway, so they've got, they've got registration right. It's comprehensive. It's any type of engineering service you have to be registered. In New South Wales, Engineers Australia and, and Institute of Public Works Engineering Australia have been on this topic for decades, I would say. Oh, um, frustrating for you. <laughs> and the argument that often comes back, there's sort of two two main arguments. One is ideologically the the parties, both party, both major parties don't really like regulating yep. things. Yeah, I think so like more like same deregulation. Issue with the real estate industry, right. but anyway, yep. And regulation they say, oh, is it red tape? Well, red tape is regulation that doesn't work or isn't needed. Mm. When regulation serves a purpose and is efficient, then it's good regulation. Yep. And that's what we're pushing for. And the other argument that comes back very often is, oh, but cost. things aren't – no, not even the cost one. Mm. Um, things aren't falling down. Well, <laughs> Sorry, let's wait for a catastrophe and then we'll regulate. That's right. And when you've got something that is so specialised as engineering, it's not something that a layperson can make a judgement about. There is a, a vast gap in understanding between the person mm. who consumes the service, whether mm. whether that service is trust in just being able to get around in life every day, as you mentioned before, Veronica, or the service is, can I buy that specific apartment? And the person who can actually provide that feeling of trust or that good value apartment. The gulf in, in understanding of the issues is so broad mm. that without without a registration scheme, there's no meaningful quality assurance mechanism in place or additional re, uh, statutory uh, influences on the practitioners to make sure that they are actually stay up to date, have the right experience, don't work outside their area of expertise because a structural engineer yeah. isn't going to really be able to work on the mechanical side and mm. vice versa. So it's not just engineering as a whole. There, there are the disciplines. Disciplines, mm. yeah. Uh, so they're the two main areas of pushback that we get. Mm. Certainly, <sighs> just to support Jonathan, it is that fear of regulation and red tape. Jonathan made a very good point, and I'd like to refer to it or think of it as green tape, not red tape. The good <laughs> regulation actually mm. is beneficial and yeah. to the community. And, and the second challenge is because the requirements are state-based and there was a pushback in 2011, 2012 through COAG to try and bring in a uniform registration scheme across Australia, bringing all the state governments on board was a little bit trying to build the 19th century railway and all the different rail gauges. Mm. So it's been state by state gradually trying to tackle this issue. I think the property market just generally people don't want to regulate, right? They don't really want to get involved and it's just too much of a money-making system that they don't really want to slow down because, you know, they want them to be built. That creates jobs if once they, you know, it creates stamp duty, it creates land taxes, it creates, there's so many things that, you know, they don't really want to upset, you know, the status quo, I guess, and, you know, potentially adding more levels to the way that the construction is built that, you know, they're just worried that that could slow things down. It, it, it's it's not actually building more levels, and I guess that's the key point. It's actually getting the levels right and getting the services done mm. right in the first place. So it actually will save money, not cost money. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?